You know, I already apologized to you for all the blurriness that happened in the last episode. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but an apology doesn't mean very much unless you also say, hey, I am not going to let that happen again. And I want you to know that you are in the most capable hands possible. I am quite confident that I am exactly the right man for this job. So you have nothing to fear because everything that you're going to see moving forward will be of such a quality that you're actually going to be overwhelmed by it. You will be so dazzled that you will occasionally experience moderate paralysis, okay? This is exactly the kind of quality that you should get to expect as a University of Illinois student and what you ought to demand from me as University of Illinois faculty. So you have nothing to fear. You are in the best capable hands. Be sure that this is exactly where you need to be. Hey everybody, welcome to PS231. I forgot to do that last time because of how capable I am. So in the previous lecture, we talked a little bit about uncertainty. We talked about how you would encode uncertainty in the form of a lottery. And then we talked about a couple of different ways that you might try to understand the lottery without having to have all of its available information in the form of ex expected value and expected utility calculations. Because we had week two and week three, I don't need to motivate week four too much. Okay, because the idea is that week four preferences over lotteries is kind of like week two preferences plus week three lotteries. So we're going to take the logic of week two where we're putting arrows on things. You're like, I thought that was behind us. Mainly. We're going we're gonna to take the, the logic of week two with the arrows and the binary preference relations. And then we're going to use that where the objects are no longer Coke, Pepsi, Sprite but rather are lotteries over some set of outcomes. The question is, how do you choose between risky things? How do you choose which risky choice to make? You might have to compare risk against the sure thing. You might have to compare risk against risk. You don't get to know what's going to happen in advance if you're choosing where at least one of the choices is risky. And so we need to make sure that you have enough apparatus or that our decision maker has enough apparatus, but you're the protagonist of the fable too. Our decision maker has enough apparatus in place to be able to to work to walk through that very murky world so that's what we're going to be talking about today is is how to think thoroughly about uncertainty and in particular how to think about how you ought to navigate it if you ever have the chance to stop and reflect sometimes you won't sometimes you will but if you do have the chance to stop and reflect i hope that this is the sort of thing that you'll be doing whenever you have a chance i believe that that's my cue to stop talking about stupid stuff and to put on some inspirational sounding music <laughs> And tell you to go get some liquids. And then say we'll get to it. So in the A block of today's lecture, we're going to talk about the set of all lotteries. Now, we already talked about what a lottery is. I showed you that a coin can be a lottery, right? A coin plus some specified outcomes associated with this coin and the associated probabilities implicit in this coin. We talked about how this coin is a lottery. We talked about how a die is a lottery or the decision to go to war is a lottery with the iron dice. What we didn't talk about is how to think about the set of all lotteries. Not how to visualize it, not what important features are out there about the set of all lotteries. Because the set of all lotteries is going to be like the set of alternatives from week two. It's going to be our capital X. It's going to be the things that we're choosing between. Now that means we have to have a good appreciation about the nature of lotteries so we can talk about the set of all lotteries over some set of outcomes that you care about. And you'll see that there's actually some very important features... Once you just stop and stare at the lotteries long enough, which is exactly what they don't want you to be doing in Springfield, but once you stop and stare at the lotteries long enough, you have no choice but to figure out that there are certain special features of the set of all lotteries. And those special features are going to be special features that we exploit in the other two blocks. For example, in the B block, we'll talk about when expected utility can be used as a utility function. When can that very simple machine of multiply all the probabilities by the utilities and then add them up? A couple of rows in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. When can we take that logic and use it to say, this is my utility function. There are many others like it, but this one is mine. And we'll see as we discuss preferences over lotteries 
that there are important postulates that we'll have to add to our completeness and transitivity postulates. There's no guarantee that the utility function that you use is going to be an easy thing. So when can be the easiest thing, the expected utility thing? I'll show you that two other assumptions will have to be imposed along the way. We'll discuss those assumptions, and then I will show you one of the most important results in the social sciences of the 20th century, the von Neumann and Morgenstern representation theorem. You'd think if it was that important, I'd be able to say it just elegantly, but if you may have learned by now, I can't say anything elegantly on the first try, except for Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. Then in the C block, I want to take all the tools that we've developed in the A and the B block to talk about risk. I want to talk about what risk looks like for an individual decision maker, and I'm going to try to frame the entire thing from a decision that you might have to make if I'm a cruel carnivore barker. If I can give you just the right tricky game, it might get you thinking. That's my goal in the C block, is to show you just the right game, the right tricky game, get you thinking, and then we'll delve into what that means for some other terms that you may have heard in other classes, and we'll see that there's actually a well-woven tapestry of all these concepts that seem disparate, but once you've gotten down to the raw source code, once you've seen what's going on underneath lotteries and preferences over lotteries, you'll be in position to see that these things are all just the same thing from different angles. So you got that to look forward to. And you're like, could you just give me a problem set and shut up, fat man? So this is a lecture that I hope it resonates a little bit because the decision makers we'll be talking about will indeed be meant to be you. So I hope that these algorithms that we talk about a little bit, I hope that all the steps that we showed last week and all the justifications we'll provide for using them this week, I hope that that's enough to persuade you to stop and be contemplative whenever you have the chance. Stop and be deliberate whenever you have the chance. There's a lot to think about, but if you just take the right steps and if you do them in just the right order and see them from just the right angle, things click into place pretty easily. So give yourself the chance to just sit and ruminate and wait for osmosis. Because these are insights that probably aren't going to hit you the first time if you're just trying to crank it. Don't squeeze. Let them come to you. Let the insights come to you, okay? You don't have to go get them. All you have to do is sit there and think. And if you do enough digging and if you do enough doodling, if you work on the problem sets hard enough and you ask the right questions, that eventually the lightning bolt will happen. The osmosis will happen. And next thing you know, you'll know more than you knew before and you won't even know why. Well... I can't say anything better than that. I'm not, I was going to try to come up with some interesting transition to get me out of this f***ing introduction. It's the hardest part of the whole thing is getting out of the introduction. But I'm not even going to try it because that was such a beautiful, profound ending to this thing that any stupid transition that I tried to come up with would just feel like the cheapest segue in the history of mankind. So let's just get started. I also forgot that the magic is supposed to happen whenever... I, I forgot the magic. I forgot the magic. The magic of television is more than just what I'm doing when I'm editing these movies. The magic of television is when I do this. So let me say this. Here in the A Block, we're going to talk about lotteries again. That's some Paul Schofield level acting there. So we're talking about lotteries, and we talked about what a lottery is last time. Remember that a lottery is just two things, right? So it's a well-specified set of possible outcomes. Right? So, for example, X could be win or lose. It could be win, lose, or draw. It could be Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, Dr. Pepper. So we've got some finite set of outcomes, and we'll be referring to capital X throughout the lecture as just some given set of outcomes. And I'll try to keep things pretty abstract here in the A and B block, and you're like, oh, thanks for that. And that's just to make sure that you don't get too led astray by any given intuitions you have about money or the war lotteries or anything like that. Let's just let the, the set of outcomes for our introductory example be heads or tails, and I'll spare you the obverse and the reverse this time. So if it's heads versus tails, those are the outcomes, heads and tails, we said last time that a way to encode that this is a fair coin, which is the notion that it comes up heads exactly as often as it comes up tails, the way that we encode that is by coming up with a list of probabilities, one for each side of the coin. So I need two probabilities. And remember, a probability is a non-negative number. We don't have negative probabilities. It could be zero, but nothing less than that. Such that all of the probabilities add to one. So in this case, we know that the coin could come up heads or tails. And therefore, the probabilities we would assign, given that it's a fair coin, are 0.5 and 0.5. It has a 0.5 probability of coming up heads and a 0.5 probability of coming up tails. Or if you multiply by 100, 50%, 50%. Without bending your mind too much, tell me, 
what's the set of all coins? What's the set of all coins where I'm saying that a coin is a two-sided thing that when you throw it, you don't quite know whether it's going to come up one way or the other way. What's, what's the set of all those? Now, we could think about the set of all coins, and that would just be some gigantic, it's a, it's a finite number. I mean, it's, there's, there's, I don't know how many coins there are in the world. That's a fun thing to think about. But when I'm talking about the set of all coins, what I mean really is what are the set of all possible lotteries over heads and tails? Not just the one animated by this particular piece of silver. Right? So if I'm thinking about the set of all lotteries over X equals heads, tails, then I need a set. I need a set. I need a set. It's a set. Here comes it. And not this set. Not this set. I need, a, I need a set. So the set is, it's the set of all, I'm going to use set builder notation. It's the set of all pairs, P1, P2, where those are both real numbers, such that P1 and P2 are both non-negative. Right, so P1 is greater than or equal to zero and P2 is greater than or equal to zero. And P1 plus P2 equals one. That's what I've been saying, is they're both non-negative numbers and they have to sum to one. You'll notice that 0 0.5, 0 0.5 satisfies those criteria and therefore it lives in the set of all lotteries. So this coin is in there, or at least the randomness that we're using it as a symbol of. And that's the set of all, you can imagine this as a line actually, because remember, that what happens is because they have to sum to one, whatever is the last one is just gonna be one minus the sum of all the others, which in two just means that you can think about this as P and one minus P, right? It doesn't have to be P one and P two, it could just be P and one minus P because that way you know they're both non-negative and you know they sum to one. For sure, that's baked into the one minus P part. So you can imagine this is a line, right? And, and you got zero on one side and you got one on the other side and you could just think about all the possible P's Right, you can think about all the possible P's that live along this line, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to, uh, this, this should be straightforward so far, should. Now, let's make it a three-way lottery because that's gonna make it easier for me to show you some of the things throughout today's lecture. So let's say that the three possible outcomes are just white, orange, and blue. So let's say that I've got three outcomes, white, orange, and blue. That's X, X equals white, orange, blue. And let's say, that I want to know all the possible probability vectors over those three outcomes. Now, you'll remember from last week's lecture that one of those we could just sort of animate with the uh, uniform, the, the, the fair version of that, which would just be one third, one third, one third, an equal chance of getting white, an, uh, orange, and blue. We also have those all those degenerate lotteries that we, that we discussed last time, the sure thing. So it could be one zero zero, which means white for sure. It could be zero one zero, which means orange for sure. It could be zero, zero, 001, which means blue for sure. It could be zero, one half, one half, which means certainly not white and 50, 50 on orange and blue, right? So there's all these different vectors of probabilities I can come up with over those three abstract outcomes. And the question is, what's the set of all those and can we visualize it? Well, in terms of the set of those, it's really just generalizing what we just did in the previous example. It's just gonna be three instead of two or in a sense, two instead of one. So we'll say that we, I just want the set over this new set of outcomes, and that's the set of all P1, P2, P3, where each one of those is a real number, so it's in R cross R cross R, or just R cubed, such that, such that uh, P1, P2, and P3 are all non-negative, they're all greater than or equal to zero, and P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals one. Non-negative and sum to one, 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 okay? Now, again, that could be, we could just animate that as P white, P orange, and P blue, which is one minus P white minus P, P orange, okay? Well, I'm, I'm sure editor Rob is really angry about having to do all this weird coloration in LaTeX. So that's the set of all lotteries, and I can't do it as a line now because I've, I've got another dimension in question. Right, so if I wanted to come up with the set of all lotteries and I wanted to see it, the same way that that line segment allowed me to see all the zero ones, well, actually it turns out that when there happens to be three outcomes, there's a nice way to visualize this and it's rich enough for me to be able to describe things to you as we go. So, I'm gonna draw what's called a simplex. This is a two simplex, right, a two simplex. The, the line segment was a one simplex. This is just a, a, this is just a triangle is what it's gonna wind up being. And what this does is it allows us to visualize the set of all lotteries over these three outcomes. 
So what I'm going to do to get started is I'm just going to draw three dots. Okay. I'm going to draw a dot up here. We'll see how symmetric I can get that. And that dot is going to represent the lottery that is white for sure. One, zero, zero. Okay. I'm going to draw another dot here. And this is going to be zero, one, zero, which is the lottery that gets you orange for sure. I'm going to draw a third dot here. And that's going to be zero, zero, one, which is the lottery that gets you blue for sure. So right now I just got three dots in space. That sounds like a really bad Netflix show. I should have just said Netflix show. What are they up to lately? I don't even know. I just scroll through and I just scroll through and I scroll through and I hate everything. And then I just watch the Great British Bacon Show anyway. Okay, so I've got these three dots. Now let's talk about those lotteries where we rule something out, that sort of zero 50-50 sort of thing. So let's think about what happens if you know you're not gonna get white for sure and you have a 50-50 chance of getting orange or blue. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna imagine that there was a line segment down here between orange and blue the same way that there was when there was just a coin, okay? And so everywhere along this line is going to represent the lotteries where white never happens. Now, that was, that was covered here in the orange dot, zero, one, zero. Well, that's one where white never happens. And the same here, zero, zero, one. That's one where white never happens. But zero, 50, 50, that happens here. Zero, 50, 50 is like halfway in between these two. I'm just trying to get you to have the intuition so that when I give you the postulates later on, they, make almost, they almost make sense, almost. Right, so this line, this bottom edge, there's a line between these two dots. And what this is, is like all the lotteries you could think of. I can't get these hands. I'm just not good at the breaststroke, right? So it's all of the lotteries here. Their white never happens. We're as far as we could be from the white dot. And we we fall somewhere in between the orange and the blue. Okay, so that's all these. Now I can repeat that exercise two other times. So if I want to rule out the blue dot, I could just think about the edge of all things that, oh boy, that's not even close. The edge of all things, the edge of this edge of lotteries, from the white to the to the orange. Well, like the 50-50 one is right about here. There's no way that's right about about here. Right. And I could get closer and closer to white. I could get closer and closer to, to orange. There's all these lotteries in between, all of which agree that blue isn't going to happen. And the question is, how likely is white relative to orange? And the same goes with white and blue over here. OK, white and blue over here. That rules orange out. And we've got white and blue. It could be 50-50. It could be white all the time. It could be blue all the time. And so now I've got this triangle, right, where I've got the three degenerate lotteries, the one where only one outcome could happen. And now these edges are all the ones where two could happen. What about all three? What about one-third, one-third, one-third? Where does one-third, one-third, one-third live? Right, it lives right in the middle, right? So one-third, one-third, one-third is right in the middle. And everywhere in between is, is a lottery. Everywhere in between is a lottery over the three possible outcomes, some of which are only one possible outcome, some of which are two. What was that? And then the rest of the interior of this triangle, that's the interior dance. The interior dance tells me that these are the ones where all three outcomes get some strictly positive probability, okay? So this is the set of all lotteries over orange, white, and blue. So this, this simplex, this is a two simplex, and this is a nice way for me to call your attention to a couple of things. So the first thing that I wanna mention is that these lotteries have taken this discrete idea of these colors, or if they were Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite, and they've allowed us to like come up with a richer space so that the things don't feel so far apart, right? So if I, I mean, I guess technically I could ask you to mix orange and blue, and what you would do first is convert them to numbers, you'd have a function that takes them to RGB space, red, green, blue, or CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and something, right? So you'd have a function that turns them into vectors and then mix the vectors, which is about what we're gonna be doing. But if I asked you about win or lose, those things seem discrete, they seem far apart. It's not like you can just slowly turn losing into winning. If I'm just talking about you could win or you could lose as discrete categories. However, even if I had win, lose, or draw, I could think about like a 50-50 chance or a one-third, one-third, one-third chance. I could, I could make them close together. And so for any given lottery in this triangle, there are lotteries close by, okay? Now in the corners, all the lotteries that are close by go one way and, and, and on, along the edges, you know, they don't, you can't go south from the south edge, but you can always find a lottery close by. 
And if you're right in the middle, then you can always draw a circle small enough that everywhere around it is a lottery too. Okay? So the first thing that I want to say is these lotteries are in this space. There's lotteries close by. Anywhere you have a lottery, you can find a direction that takes you to another lottery, if, no matter how short of a line that you draw. More importantly, and relatedly, I can take any two lotteries and mix them and make a third lottery. I can mix them. We, I, I actually just sort of alluded to this logic as I was introducing the triangle in the first place. Let me just give you the logic of mixing uh, a slightly different way and then we'll come back to the simplex. So let's just say that you could win or you could lose again. Let's just have a binary outcome, okay? And I'm gonna show you two lotteries over that outcome. So lottery one is the lottery where you win all the time and you never lose, one, zero. And lottery two is the one where you lose all the time and never win, zero, one. So here you win all the time and here you lose all the time. And what I want to show you is that I can come up with a third lottery that represents some mix of the two depending on some other number that I choose. This is actually just taking the compound lottery logic and putting it all in one place. So suppose that I had some number, we'll call it alpha. And alpha, I know you're getting scared right now. Alpha, it's okay. Alpha is a number that lives between zero and one. And when alpha equals one, that's gonna mean that we're in world one all the time. And when alpha equals zero, that's gonna mean we're in world two all the time. But if alpha equals something in between, if it's a, a half or a third or two thirds or three fifths, if alpha is some number in between, then we're gonna come up with another lottery that represents the mix of the two, okay? And what that winds up being is alpha times the first lottery plus one minus alpha times the second. I'm just mixing, I'm taking, I'm taking a proportion of alpha from this column and a proportion of one minus alpha from this column. So in this world that I've made where I've got, some, I've, got some, I've got one lottery that's one zero and another lottery that's zero one, I can make a third column using alpha. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each cell and it's gonna be alpha times this row's number plus one minus alpha times this one. So in this example, it would be alpha times one plus one minus alpha times zero is alpha. And likewise in the second row, it's going to be alpha times zero plus one minus alpha times one is one minus alpha. And that's a lottery because alpha is a number between zero and one and alpha plus one minus alpha equals one. So for example then, if alpha equals three quarters, that means that I'm like three quarters, I'm taking three quarters of my stuff from this from this column, and I'm taking a quarter of my stuff from this column. So I wind up with three quarters, one quarter, okay? It's more similar to the first lottery than it is to the second because alpha was greater than one half. Conversely, if alpha was one eighth, then I would have one eighth, seven eighths. And that would be a lot more similar. That's, that lottery is more similar to the second lottery than it is to the first. I'm just mixing lotteries. I'm just mixing lotteries to make new lotteries. So the idea of alpha is it, it, it allows me to take any two lotteries and mix them. And if alpha is really close to one, then I'm more this way. And if alpha is really close to zero, I'm more this way. We're about to visualize this, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like just in terms of the Excel spreadsheets, which again is just an eight bit bad guy kind of thing. So let's go back to the simplex and visualize that. So that all this means is that if I take any two dots, let's say that I just randomly draw two, two dots in my simplex here and here then what I can do is think about all of the mixes between them, all of the possible lotteries that fall in between them. And that's just the line that falls between those two dots. You can just imagine if you wanted to that I've got like a little slider here. I've got like a little dial and I can dial alpha up or dial alpha down, right? So I'm dialing alpha up or alpha down. When alpha is really high, then I'm close to the first dot. And when alpha is really low, I'm close to the second dot, okay? In the extreme, if alpha equals one, then I'm at the first dot. And if alpha equals zero, then I'm at the second dot. Boy, Editor Rob has a lot of work to do. Most importantly, notice that I can calculate the expected utility for any one of these. This is an input set. This triangle is the set of all lotteries. And remember, a lottery is something where I can calculate an expected utility if I want to. Right, so I can, for every one of these uncountably infinite lotteries in this, in this here thing, I can calculate an expected utility using the exact same rule specified last week. To do so, I would assign a utility to white, assign a utility to orange, and assign a utility to blue. I would assign a utility to each of these things and then multiply each outcome by its respective probability as encoded by the lottery in question and wind up with an expected utility. 
Just for example, if my utility for white is 3, my utility for orange is 2, and my utility for blue is 1, then that means that my favorite lotteries are the ones far north, close to the white lottery, close to the dot. And I'm, I, I'm less happy as we go down toward the orange dot, but notice that I get, I get unhappier fastest as I get to the blue dot. This is my very least favorite lottery, if that were the situation, because it gives me the most chances of my least favorite outcome, blue. This is my favorite lottery because it gives me the highest chances of my favorite outcome, white. And we got some in-betweeners too. So you can imagine this just as a big gradient or something. So I just wanted you to see the set of all lotteries because this is going to be the set of alternatives that our decision maker is choosing over. It is no longer going to be the case that uh, they're choosing just between Coke, Pepsi, Sprite. Now they're choosing over all these things and we know that the decision maker can calculate an expected utility if they so desired. The question is what kind of preferences over these lotteries does our decision maker have to have in order for the expected utility function that we spent so much time on last week to be a representation of their preferences, something that is higher when they are happier and lower when they are less happy. Can they assign numbers to their happiness over these things? And it turns out that here they're actually going to be assigning a meaningful scale. Let's talk about what the preferences over these things would have to look like, but that means that we have to transition again. So let's just head over to the B block. So here in the B block, I want to talk about preferences over lotteries. Preferences plus lotteries equals preferences over lotteries. So we're just going to take what we did in week two, A block, and talk about lotteries instead. And you're like, I don't know what it looks like to choose between lotteries. This seems, this seems weird to me. And well, remember, you went to a mini mart for your Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite. Or, and Dr. Pepper, and, and all sorts of different things. And that's quick, monster energy drink. But at the mini mart at the front, there were multiple lotteries. Right, so here's the here's the ten grand. You no, know, the, here's the ten grand that we spent so much time with, and here's another lottery. This is the loose change multiplier. Boy, that sounds fancy and scientific, but you know what this thing does? It takes away thirty seven cents on the dollar. I actually I got a bunch of these, and I worked them all through, and then I went to the Illinois lottery website and I worked them all through, and just about every lottery, just about every lottery that you can buy, and there were like sixty five. I collected data on sixty five lotteries, and all of them gave you between 63 and 64 and a half cents on the dollar. I mean, that's just, and that's not an accident. That's, the, that's what they're expecting to get. So here's two lotteries. I can choose between two lotteries, right? And the question is, when I hold these two things the same way that I once held Coke and Pepsi, how do I have preferences over these two lotteries? This is, this is our goal, okay? And I'm gonna introduce the notion that I have a binary preference relation. I'm gonna say that I like one of these lotteries at least as much as the other, I could say the 10 grand is at least as good as loose change multiplier, right? That's, that's a well-formed statement. If I buy this and not this, then you might as well figure that I like this at least as much as this, right? Same with the 7-Eleven 21. For any, right, there's all, all sorts of different lotteries. In fact, you just saw a simplex with all these lotteries, but I can just think about any two of them the same way that I thought about any two of the drinks at the Mini Mart. So too can I think about any two of the lotteries there. Now we spent enough time on that over in the, over in week two, and then the associated problem set that I'm not gonna linger here too long. If you have trouble with what the sentence is at least as good as means, two, two, two. If you have, if you have uh, any thoughts about, if you have any apprehensions about what at least as good as means or how we model with that sentence, go back to week two. I'm really tempted to be like a YouTuber and be like, oh, and here's the card that will take you. But I don't know. I'm not really much of a YouTuber if you haven't noticed. I'm not going to land here too long, but you could think about if I have the, these five lotteries out of the set of all lotteries, I had five in my hand, then I could just imagine five dots in a doodle. And I could imagine arrows encoding that I like one at least as much as the other. The problem is because there's such a large number of lotteries living in my simplex or wherever, there's such a large set of lotteries that, you know, drawing five with the arrows, it seems a little bit laughable. That's more conceptual, but that's the same idea. Is at least as good as arrows, squigglies, etc. Okay, and I'm gonna tell you four things that have to be true. And instead of visualizing it in a doodle, I'm gonna visualize it on our simplex. I'm gonna give you four assumptions, four rationality postulates about choice under uncertainty. So I'm gonna take completeness and transitivity and I'm gonna to add to them, right? So completeness and transitivity work very well in the case where everything is certain, 
but we're gonna try to take advantage of this rich space that we have, this simplex that we have. We're gonna try to take advantage of it to squeeze more than just there exists a utility function, okay? So I'm going to assume first and foremost that our decision maker has complete preferences over the set of all lotteries. What do I mean by that? That means that if I choose any two lotteries out of this big dot, call them X and Y, X is a lottery and Y is a lottery. I need to know that either X is at least as good as Y or Y is at least as good as X or both. Choose any two dots on this triangle. What I'm saying to you is it's going to be the case that our decision maker, when they look at this triangle, has to be able to pull out any two dots and at least be indifferent between them. They can either put one strictly ahead of the other or they can say that they're indifferent. They're not allowed to say, I don't know. And the more active learners among you are trying to think about how this all fits from what you know. This also implies that everybody is indifferent between the lottery and itself. So for any lottery, that lottery is at least as good as itself. Completeness, again, go back to week two. I'm not, I'm not gonna put the card every time. I don't even know how to do that yet. I'm saying I'm gonna do this and I have no idea. Assumption two, transitivity, right? So, so if you choose any three dots in this, in this triangle, such that the first dot is at least as good as the second and the second is at least as good as the third, so you choose any two dots and you have a chain, then you must also be able to reliably infer that you like the first as much as the third. That actually, be, this is the beginning of the wrinkles with uncertainty. So on your problem set, I'm gonna be showing you a series of wrinkles and problems with expected utility. I'll be showing you little, little things that annoy, little flies in the ointment in this theory that I'm teaching you. I don't think this is a perfect theory for the record. It isn't, it's just a nice way to get yourself started thinking about this stuff. And we're gonna use it all throughout the rest of the class. So complete and transitive, complete and transitive, right? That just pertains to if I pull dots out. For any two dots, I have to have at least one arrow. And for any three dots where I've got a chain, I also have to have uh, the corresponding other arrow that sort of completes the chain. No cycles, nothing like that, okay? So we're, we're where we were. Now in this infinite context, I can't even tell you that there's a utility function to work with just yet. I actually need another assumption just to guarantee the existence of a utility function. Remember, I worked very hard all throughout week two to say I've got a finite set of alternatives and look, this isn't anywhere close to finite. There's an infinite number of dots in this triangle. In fact, the thought about just pulling out one dot almost seems, it'll bend your mind if you let it. Go burn a candle. And then you're like, then what? Just stare into the fire until it occurs to you. I don't, why do I have to tell you how to be a weirdo? Third assumption. I'm not very good. I've always done it like this. This is how I put up three fingers, but then then you could do like the shibboleth thing in, in Glorious Bastards. Maybe that's the way to do it. Cause I'm just not very good at this. Are you good at this? Is anybody good at this? This is stupid. Why is this the way that we do three fingers? It should be this or this. So the third assumption is that we're gonna call this continuity. Sometimes you hear this given other names, I'm just gonna call this continuity. All right, so the idea here is that we're not going to allow any funky jumps. And it isn't, it's not gonna be obvious from today's lecture, but the way that we rule out funky jumps is by imposing a particular assumption about lotteries and mixes in lotteries. You'll, you'll see what I mean here precisely in a second. So suppose that I have three lotteries, call them X, Y, and Z, and I'll draw them here in the simplex. And suppose that X is at least as good as Y, and Y is at least as good as Z. Okay, so, so transitivity also tells me that X is at least as good as Z, but I'm gonna go a little bit further. I'm gonna go a little bit further, I'm adding more. There has to be some mix of X and Z, the good lottery and the bad lottery. There has to be some mix of X and Z, such that that mix is indifferent to Y. So at the extreme, let's just consider the case where I indeed like white best, and then orange, and then blue. So here's three degenerate lotteries. My favorite is my favorite is one zero zero. My second favorite is zero one zero, and my least favorite is zero zero one. So those play the role of X, Y, and Z in in this example. So what I'm saying is there has to be some mix of just X and Z, just white and blue, something along this edge. There has to be something along this edge, such that wherever we are, we're indifferent between that lottery along this edge and the middle lottery. Now look, you could you could shrink the whole triangle, you could expand the whole triangle, but whatever, but whatever you do, this pattern has to hold. The pattern has to be, if you have a favorite and you have a least favorite in the middle, then you have to be able to find an appropriate alpha, just the right mix of the two. Now look, if, if you like the top one a lot, and then this was, if, if your middle one is pretty good, and then your, your, your least favorite is really bad? Well, if that's the case, then you assume that the mix is gonna be pretty close to the good one. Similarly, if, if the middle one is, is more bad than good, 
then the mix is probably going to take you pretty close to the bad one. But what I'm saying is you have to be able to find something along this edge that gets you where you need to go so that you're indifferent between the mixed lottery and the middle lottery. That's continuity. And the idea is we have to do this on as small as possible. So this was the biggest possible spread where we are on all three corners. And the idea is you have to be able to do this even if you zoom all the way into just three lotteries that are really all close to one another. Okay? So I'll, I'll be able to say the following already. So, so here's a result. Suppose our decision maker has preferences over these lotteries that are complete, transitive, and continuous and satisfy this, this last thing. Then now I know there exists a utility function over the set of lotteries, and I know that that utility function is continuous. I never have to lift my pencil as I draw. If I was like drawing how happy I am about this lottery coming out of the screen, like how high is the mountain coming out of the screen? Look, I'm coming out of you, right? So if I was doing that, if I, was, if I was trying to draw how happy I am because of all these lotteries, if I was drawing a utility function, I would never have to lift my pencil here in the three-dimensional space we'd be living in with the depth, right? There would be no sudden changes in my utility owing to small changes in the lottery. Small changes in lotteries yield small changes in utility, okay? So what I'm saying up to this point is, if you give me those three assumptions, then I know there exists a utility function that represents my preferences over these things. So this is clean enough to be representable by a continuous utility function, which sounds pretty good. But it isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be the linear, nice, easy to compute Microsoft Excel spreadsheet expected utility function. All I said is there exists a continuous utility, fu utility function. I didn't say it was a good one. So is there a way for us to take what we have, like a, a continuous utility function, and turn it into something even easier to use because I'm lazy? I'm so lazy that I want to be able to just do spreadsheet work whenever I consider my preferences over these things. So I want to talk about this fourth assumption implicit in this style of analysis. In this theory, this is the big thing. This is the big thing about how people make choices over uncertainty. This is as big as transitivity, right? Because when I'm talking about stronger rationality, when I'm talking about the sort of rationality that we would ask of a decision maker choosing among uncertain alternatives, then I'm going to ask one more thing, and it's really, it's, it's a big thing, and it's actually something of normative appeal. It's something that I would hope that a decision maker that I elected to office would live up to, and something that I would hope that you as my students would try to live up to as well. I'd be okay with going one for two on that. And this is called the independence axiom. And the independence axiom actually isn't all that hard. It seems reasonable when I say it, and then you take it to the laboratory, and you can find situations where people really don't live up to it, which you'll see on your problem set. Okay, so, so here, check this out. Suppose I have two lotteries, call them X and Y, and suppose that X is at least as good as Y. What, now, what independence means is if I take any other third lottery, call it Z, any other lottery, and any other potential mix, call it alpha, then I have to like the mix of X and Z, whatever that mix is, I have to like that new mix at least as much as the same mix of Y and Z. Let's try and visualize that because that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense until you see it. So suppose I have two lotteries. Let's call them X and Y. They live, they, they live here in the triangle. Okay. And suppose I've got some third lottery Z. And I'm just choosing this arbitrarily. It has to work for any Z. Take X and Y and tell me that X is at least as good as Y. X is at least as good as Y. And I've chosen any third lottery, call it Z. I've chosen any third lottery, call it Z. And what I'm saying is, for any lottery that I drew, right now all I know is X at least is Y, and then I just randomly chose some Z. What has to be true is if I think about the mixes between X and Z and Y and Z, and I set any alpha, I choose some alpha arbitrarily. It could be something really, it could be alpha really high so that I'm close to X and Y. It could be alpha really low so that I'm close to Z. So what I'm saying is, on these two lines, if I choose the same proportion so that this is alpha X plus one minus alpha Z, and this is alpha Y plus one minus alpha Z. Same alpha, same Y, same mix amount and same target. If I, if I have these two lotteries now, it's not X and Y, now it's alpha X plus one minus alpha Z and alpha Y plus one minus alpha Z. And if these are my two lotteries, I have to like this one at least as much as this one. Right, so if I like these two and then I mix them against the same thing with the same proportions, then I have to, I can't change my preferences as I go. That's called the independence axiom. It's actually not that hard to find real world situations where if you ask people, you give people two lotteries, X and Y, and they, they'll tell you how they feel about one versus the other. 
and then you mention some third one and say, well, okay, no, I'm actually going to throw in some chance about this third one too. And then suddenly they switch, their, they change their mind. It's not that hard because people are human and this is just a fable. So now I've got four assumptions, complete, transitive, continuous, and independent. And I am now prepared to tell you one of the most important results. Like if, if this wasn't true or if this hadn't been discovered, then I would have nothing to talk to you about. Right? This, this is very much foundational. So suppose I have some finite set of alternatives X. And suppose I consider the set of all lotteries over that X. And suppose that I have preferences over that set of all lotteries over X. And suppose that those preferences satisfy completeness, transitivity, cont continuity, and independence. So everything we've talked about up to this point. Those things are all true. If and only if I can represent my preferences over these lotteries with the expected utility function so that higher expected utilities indicate higher preference ranking. So if I'm willing to make these four assumptions about myself or of you, they all seem plausible. I mean, they seem abstract in some stupid picture, but they all seem plausible. What I'm saying to you is this expected utility calculation that we did last week is a reasonable way to evaluate people's preferences over lotteries. If and only if they live up to those four axioms. I'm, I'm just reaching for beverages everywhere. I don't know if I want hot or cold. And the answer from my sweat is I want cold. Mango bubbly water is at least as good as oolong tea. But they're both in my choice set. This is the von Neumann and Morgenstern representation theorem. First proved in their monumental theory of games and economic behavior, which was developed just at the end of World War II and helped to launch a lot of thoughts about how to make decisions in strategic environments. You could imagine that right after World War II, many people were concerned about how to make decisions well. How do we avoid catastrophe in the future? And though those efforts were not always listened to, and though those efforts were, you know, flawed because you could only do so much at any moment in time, despite all that, it was one of the most important developments in the social sciences of the 20th century. If this hadn't been shown in that important treatise, then I probably wouldn't be a professor. I mean, I, I'd have nothing to talk to you about. I would, I would be, I mean, we can all make guesses. I'd probably be a chef. I'd like to think that I would own a burger joint. Okay? So... So actually, the, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of, I like thinking about all these interesting little things going on in the triangle. And it turns out that all these interesting little things that you can see in the triangle map to how you would think about the triangle. What would your preferences over the triangle be? But it turns out that there's some downsides because even though it's really fun to doodle in this triangle, some of the things that you draw might not adequately capture some important nuanced aspects of human behavior. I'm talking about lines in the triangle. So what utility function I'm choosing suddenly begins to matter. There's more information that I'm asking of that utility function. And I want to talk about all the different nuances. Well, not all of them. But I want to talk about some of the different nuances in that choice of a scale. And it turns out that that choice of a scale will tap into something that you've probably experienced before. And the fact that you've experienced it means that we're going to go a little bit less robotic in the C block, which I'm looking forward to because I don't know about you, but nobody makes decisions quite like this. Things will get a lot more human there. So let's go there. So here in the C block, I want to deliver on the name of the lecture by talking about risk. Now, expected utility calculations are really important, but they don't capture, right off the bat, they don't capture everything you might need to know about how humans actually make decisions. And what I'm going to show you is just one cheap workaround, but I don't want you to think that any of this is a panacea. It's important, this is an ongoing literature, how to properly encode how people make decisions among risky alternatives, okay? This is not a conversation that's ever going to stop. But I just want to show you something interesting that you might use to resolve some of the tensions, but not all of them. And in fact, some of the solutions are themselves problematic. I'm a little bit too philosophical today, I think. But thinking about risk and uncertainty 
Do you have any choice but to get philosophical? You feel both powerless and full of agency, right? I mean, this is interesting. I mean, it's a fun thing to think about. So I want to I want to play a carnival barker game with you. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my carnival barker hat, which I don't have one, so don't worry about act outs. So I'm gonna toss. I, I got my walk in liberty. You love it. I love it. We all love the walk in liberty. All right. So here's the game. I'm gonna toss this coin. I might have to toss it several times. So I'm gonna toss this coin. And if it comes up tails the first time that I toss it, then the game is over. If it comes up tails, the game is over and you get $2. Not bad. But if it comes up heads, I'll toss it again. And if it comes up tails on exactly the second toss, the game will be over and you'll get $4. And if it comes up heads, then I'll toss it again. And if it comes up tails on the third toss, then you get $8. And the game is over then. And if it comes up heads, then I toss the coin again. And if it comes up tails on exactly the fourth toss, then you get $16. It just keeps doggling. Two, four, eight, 16. And, and so on, right? I mean, theoretically speaking, right? I could, I could toss this coin an infinite number of times. And it, it's, it's possible, it's highly unlikely, but it's possible that it would come up heads for a very long sequence. I could toss a thousand heads in a row. It's possible. It's possible. It's improbable, but it's possible. Okay. There's, there's a more famous version of this. So suppose that you had a monkey sitting at a typewriter and just r randomly hitting on, hitting all these keys. Well, if they were, if they did that for an infinite amount of time, then, you know, the probability that they would type out all the works of Shakespeare by accident one time is one. Now that's stupid. I mean, that's a mind bender. That's a mind bender. That's a mind bender. But it just goes to show that infinity is a hell of a drug. So this game is straightforward. If you get if you get tails the first time, two dollars. If you get tails the second time, four dollars. Tails the third time, eight dollars. So it's it's pretty good. You can't lose this game. The worst you could do is get two dollars. If if and you have like a 50-50 chance of that happening. Right, so that, that's way better odds than you would get from the state, right? When, when you when, with this crap, you get sixty three cents on the dollar, right? So, I'm asking you, what would you pay for the chance to play this lottery? This lottery where two, four, eight, six, sixteen, depending on how many heads in a row the game begins with, what would you pay? What would you pay to play this game? Think about it. Pause the video, and I mean, there isn't a right answer. There isn't a right part of what I'm about to talk about is there isn't a right answer. So, so what would you pay? What would you pay? I would hope you would pay at least $2, right? Because that's the worst case scenario, right? But but what beyond $2 would you be willing to pay? What beyond $2? Would you be willing to pay $10 for this? Let's do auction. Would you be willing to pay $10 to play that game? Maybe. 50? 100? Would you be willing to give a 100 bucks? Uh, we'll do 500. Would you be willing to give up 500 bucks? Would you give up a month at Chipotle to play this game where there's a 50% chance you get $2? Maybe not. What's the expected value of this lottery? Well, the probability of getting $2. So, so that's the outcome. The outcomes is the set of all, it's like the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. It just, it's the set of all numbers that are two to the n for some natural number n right that's a set of all, all possible outcomes and the probability of getting two dollars is one half the probability of getting four dollars is one half times one half is one quarter the probability of getting eight dollars is one half times one half times one half which is one eighth the probability of getting sixteen dollars is one half times one half times one half times one half which is one sixteenth and so actually what you wind up doing to this sequence, it's like the probability times the number, the probability times the number, the probability times the number, and it winds up being one half times $2 plus one quarter times $4 plus one eighth times $8 plus one sixteenth times $16 plus one thirty second times $32 plus one sixty fourth times $64 plus one, 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 I can't do fractions, one I have to start with a one, but you get the idea, dot, 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 which is just one plus one plus one plus one plus one, an infinite number of times. This lottery that I just described to you is worth an infinite number of dollars. And you wouldn't even give me 50 bucks for it. You ingrate. You good for nothing ingrate.
I offered you the investment opportunity of a lifetime, and you figured that your burritos were more important. You made a good choice. But that's the thing is that the lottery, as we just described it, this abstract thought experiment, which is called the St. Petersburg Paradox, it was discovered by one of the Bernoulli brothers. So, so there, were, there, were, there were Bernoullis, there were many Bernoullis, these were Swiss mathematicians in the 1700s. And this was discovered, this, this paradox was first used to make this sort of argument in the 1700s. Again, this is about how measurable is utility. This St. Petersburg Paradox, that's the name of this thing I just described. The St. Petersburg Paradox gets you thinking because it shows you to think just in terms of expected value. If it's just the number, of, if it's just dollars and cents, if you're making just a dollars and cents calculation, then the best thing for you to do is something that prima facie appears very stupid. So, so this lottery, you, you wouldn't pay that much for it. An interesting question is, well, how, would, how could you come up with a number? What function could you use other than the function that I just described? What function could you use to appropriately assign numbers that let us know how you feel? Because as of right now, the expected value function gets you infinite, which is not a very useful number because that, that would put that ahead of any other lottery that had offered finite value. So you would give up a house to play that game. You would give up a billion dollars to play that game. Because a billion dollars is nothing compared to the infinite dollars you would expect to play if you played the St. Petersburg Paradox game. So there's a couple different ways to resolve this. And it turns out that some concepts that are really important will kick in along the way. So one thing is that money has diminishing returns, right? If you have zero dollars and I give you one dollar, there's a one dollar gap from where you were to where you are. I take you from zero to one dollar, not bad. Now you have all sorts of new capacities at your disposal. There's all these things that you could buy for a dollar that you couldn't for, for zero dollars, right? You can go to Doc Taco Bell and eat for like a day. You could eat a day at Taco Bell. You could survive a day at Taco Bell with a dollar. Two dollars, the gap between one dollar and two dollars is probably still pretty good, right? The gap between two dollars and three dollars is probably still pretty good. Every time I give you a new dollar, that new dollar gap gives you all sorts of new things, all sorts of new possibilities, and presumably the things that you got with those possibilities would be things that made you happier. But think about the difference between a thousand dollars and a thousand plus one. It's the same gap, but there aren't a whole lot of things that fall exactly between a thousand and a thousand plus one dollars, right? What about a million and a million plus one dollars? You take a millionaire and you give them a dollar and say, hey, you're welcome. And they're like, you have not changed my life at all. If you give a dollar to somebody that's asking for a dollar on the street, you have changed their day. If you take the richest person in the world and give them a dollar, you have annoyed them. There's diminishing returns on money. The gap isn't the same. At lower levels, you get happier faster. And that plateaus eventually. Depending on who you ask, it might eventually start to go down. But I'm just going to say that it's nice to have money. There's diminishing returns. Now let's think about what that looks like. So suppose that I just draw a little axis here. And here on this axis, I'll have how much money you have. Okay, so on the, on the horizontal axis, how much money do you have? And on the vertical axis, how happy you are, are you from the money? Now in the previous example, in, this, in the introductory St. Petersburg paradox example, every additional dollar winds up making you the same amount happier. So suppose you're at zero, zero, zero dollars and zero happiness points, we'll say. One dollar, one happiness point. Two dollars, two happiness points. Three, three, four, four. This is like a nice line. There's a linear utility, right? So, so the shape of this is a line. And it maybe maybe it's true that that you just don't like you don't get one dollar for dollar. Maybe you get taxed at some rate that's constant, in which case the whole line would flatten, but it would still be a line. And maybe you just love having money around so you can count it. And so every additional dollar would take you steeper, but it's still just a line. Right. So the idea is I've got some line and that represents sort of a baseline initial. I showed you the paradox and every dollar was the same sort of thing. The idea here is that once you get to a trillion dollars, an additional dollar doesn't get you all that much. So, so this scale is too constant. Okay. So consider instead one where you start off and you're kind of getting happier as you go. You get happier and happier and happier here at the low levels, but eventually it starts to diminish. You're still getting happier. We're still going up, but you're getting happier at a slower rate. 
The slope of the line is getting shallower as we go. Now the slope of the line depends on where we are. Here the line is always the same. It has one slope. Here the slope depends. Early on it's pretty steep and then it's flattening as we go. It's always positive, but it's flattening as we go. This is calculus without teaching you calculus. Okay. Now notice the shape that emerges, right? It's bendy and it's bendy facing down. You might have learned a term for that somewhere deep in your, might even be like middle school math, because it's one of those terms that they teach you and then you never use it again, but they should keep talking about it because this is an important thing. This is what you would call a concave function, concave. So what concave means is if I take any two points along the line, say, say one of the low ones and one of the high ones, the function is always above just the mix between the two. It's, it's the function lives above the line that I would draw, which is just the linear version. So concave means you're always above and conversely convex means you're always below. Okay. So, so concave linear and convex. So diminishing returns, if we think about them, you can encode them here with the concave function. You have a, you, your utility for not money. Now there's that intermediate step where it's not just dollars and dollars and dollars and dollars, but rather utility over dollars, utility over dollars, utility over dollars. That intermediate step encodes how you feel. And the idea is that you're getting happier at a slower rate as we give you money, as you get richer. Now you may have seen functions that are concave. I'm going to choose one at random, one that's easy for you to think about, and it won't scare you that much. So let's say that instead of getting X happiness points for having X dollars. Let's say you get the square root of X happiness points. Square root of X. So if you get $2, you get the square root of two happiness points. $4, two happiness points. $16, four happiness points. $81, nine happiness points. You're good at square roots, they tell me. Instead of just going dollar for dollar, now the utils measurement will go up slower. It'll be concave, okay? Now, what would happen if I did the same calculation of the St. Petersburg paradox, but instead of thinking about $2, $4, $8, $16, instead, what if I thought about square root of two happiness points, square root of four happiness points, square root of eight happiness points, square root of 16 happiness points? What would happen if I used utility in between? What if I calculated the expected utility for a diminishing returns person in the St. Petersburg paradox? Would I still go, go to some infinite number? No. This infinite sum, this sum of an infinite number of things would wind up converging is the term. It would not go to infinity. The number that you would assign to this lottery, if you use that scale, if you use the square root scale is 1.9 and change. It's one of these big complicated formulas. I'm not gonna show you how, you don't have to worry about that. I'm just trying to make a point to you conceptually. I'm just trying to make a point to you conceptually. I've, you're, I don't, we don't have to talk about how to confute infinite sums, okay? I don't, I, we're not going there. But it's just interesting that by virtue of taking this notion of diminishing returns, which is an important facet of our lives, it's about how we experience getting more stuff. Eventually, we get, we get to a point where more stuff doesn't make us that much happier. And if we take that into account, which just seems like a human thing, then suddenly we've resolved this paradox by virtue of having a concave utility function and then using expected utility calculations on a concave utility function, which just means a diminishing returns respecting utility function. Okay. 1.9053. That's the happiness points. If I chose a different concave function, it would still converge. If I chose the log, it would be like 1.2 and change. So in particular, if the expected utility of this lottery is 1.9, right? Then in order to figure out how many dollars this is worth to me, I would just need to square 1.9 and that would be how much happiness I got out of that initial amount of money. So for just under $4, if I was using the square root thing, I would take just under $4 instead of playing the stupid game. $4 if I was using square roots to, 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 to encode my, my diminishing returnsiness. Now it turns out the diminishing returnsiness is gonna be related to another concept that uh, might seem a little bit more relevant to you. So let's talk about preferences about risk. And in particular, I wanna talk about the three words that you hear, risk aversion, risk neutrality, and risk acceptance. And those are all just three different classifications on the same concept, okay? So suppose that I give you a lottery that has a bunch of different outcomes that get strictly positive probability. Let's just say that there's um, three possible outcomes, just to keep life very simple. And let's suppose that the lottery has a possibility of getting all three, right? None of them has a zero probability. None of them has a one probability. 
so so just to keep things simple, let's say the lottery is over one, zero, and minus one. Those are the outcomes. And let's say that just to keep things introductory, that it's one third, one third, one third chance. So you have a one third chance of getting one, you have a one third chance of getting zero, and you have a one third chance of getting minus one. And let's say that this is for dollars. Let's say that this is a game where like I taught, you know, I, I you have a one third chance of winning a dollar, a zero, uh, a one third chance of getting zero dollars and a one third chance of losing a dollar. And let's say that there's another game, which is just don't do anything. You get zero dollars for sure. Now, some of you would play the game. Some of you, if I said to you, well, I'm, you know, you have a one third chance of a dollar, zero and minus one, you have equal chances of all those. Some of you would say, okay, I'd I, I'll play that game. That sounds fun. Some of you would say, I'll, I'll play that game. It sounds fun. And some of you would say, I don't want to play that game. It doesn't sound fun. So, so you would just do nothing for sure. Now notice something with me. Now the expected utility that you might get if you just had like a, a if you just had linear preferences, if, it, if you didn't have diminishing returns over the money, if you didn't have diminishing returns over the money, then the expected utility of this lottery is exactly equal to zero, right? One third times one plus one third times zero plus one third times minus one. That's plus a third plus zero minus a third that have zero. So the game that I offered you offers the same exact, same exact expected utility as the doing nothing for sure. So if you choose to play it, you're saying that something risky is at least as good as something safe. That would mean that you're risk acceptant. Risk acceptant. Risk acceptant person is somebody that says, okay, you show me a lottery that has some expected value and you show me a sure thing that has the same exact expected value. I'll play the lottery. I like risk. I accept risk. I'm, I'd rather play the lottery. You probably know people like that. And you don't have to be the same way all the time, but you know some people that enjoy walking into casinos more than, than other people. Now, suppose that I instead said, well, there's a two thirds chance of winning a dollar, a one sixth chance of getting zero dollars and a one sixth chance of, of, of minus one dollars, right? So now I've shifted the probabilities a little bit. And in shifting the probabilities, now I've got something that has a strictly positive expected value. So the expected value of that game is now not zero anymore. So now the expected value of that game is one half, which is more than zero. So you, in expectation, if I offered you that game, then you would get, in expectation, you would win money, but not all of you would play it. Some of you would say, you know what? I don't like that one six chance of losing a dollar. And even though that's more than outweighed by the two thirds chance of winning a dollar, I, I'm just not gonna play. So if you prefer sure things to bets where the bets offer you more expected value, which is a lot of people, including the people in the St. Petersburg paradox, if that's the case, then you're risk averse. A risk averse person prefers sure things to bets that offer a higher expected value, a higher expected utility. So I give you some, some bet and you say, you know, that sounds like a pretty good bet, but I just, I just can't, I just can't take the, I just don't like the action. I just can't take it in my stomach. That's some people, they're risk averse. Most people are risk averse. I'm risk averse. Most people are risk averse. Most people are risk averse. It's okay. Most people are risk averse. We, we will oftentimes assume, we will most often assume that people are risk averse or risk neutral, which I'll discuss here in a second. We typically will not be thinking that much about modeling risk acceptant people not because we think that they're stupid or bad, but just because they don't pop up all that often in really important decisions, right? So if the, if the world was full of risk accepting people, then there'd be a lot more wars. Now on the, on, the, on the plus side, we might have more inventions in the world, right? So, so you have to be pretty risk accepting to say, you know, I'm gonna stop working and I'm gonna go try to invent something, right? So we might have more on the good side, but we'd have more people that don't have anything because they didn't manage to invent anything. They, they didn't get that cool St. Petersburg paradox coin toss. Risk neutral people are people that are indifferent between sure things and bets that offer the same expected value. And this is more often than not where our naive beginning of things will be is a risk neutral person who, if you offered them something with which in expectation was risky, but gave them a dollar, they would be indifferent between that and a dollar for sure. So risk averse, risk neutral, and risk acceptant are all in terms of the expected value of a sure thing versus the expected value of a not so sure thing. And some people like sure things, they value sure things. And some people value not so sure things. You're, you're gonna have a retirement fund to manage one day. 
And you're going to have to choose between relatively certain things like cash, precious metals, bonds. Those things are a little bit more consistent. There's less risk involved, but they don't go up quite as fast. On the other hand, stocks are prone to going up and down, right? But you, but So there's a lot more risk, but they oftentimes offer a higher expected rate of return, right? So you're going to have to balance risk in your own life when you decide how much of your portfolio should be in stocks and how much should be in bonds and, and cash and other stuff like that. This is just true. You're going to start a retirement account in the next 10 years, and that's going to be something that befuddles you when you first get started. And what it is, is how much do you like the short thing versus the risk? And when you're young, you should like risk because you're going to have 30, 40 years to let the expectation gods let things play out. But as you get older, eventually you'll say, you know what? I don't feel like making bets anymore. I'm retiring tomorrow. Let's not make any bets. So I want to give you one result before we conclude. And it's kind of interesting. Suppose that we just have all the setup that we have up to this point. It turns out that somebody is risk averse if and only if they have a concave utility function, which is to say if they have diminishing returns. So those were two very different stories that I used to animate things. One was, if I keep giving you dollars, you get less and less happy. You get happier, but you get happier at a slowing down rate, which seems like a true story. And the other one was, some people are out there that they just don't get a good feeling in their stomach when you offer them a gamble. And they prefer things that are certain to things that are gambles. Those are two very different stories. Very different stories that I just tried to tell you. Very different fables. What I'm telling you is, they're the same thing. Concave, diminishing returns, if and only if, risk accept, uh, risk averse. Convex, if and only if, risk accepting. Linear, if and only if risk neutral. So the shapes of the function, the shape, apparently that's an 8-bit bad guy thing again, the shapes of the function, how we look at this football, the shape of this edge versus this edge versus the line, that, that gives us lots of useful information, not just about the diminishingness of the returns or the not so diminishingness of the returns, but also of the underlying notion of risk acceptance. So when we do expected utility calculations, when we have all these lotteries and steps and then we see that these steps in the algorithms are meant to convey meaning about our preferences. It turns out that what's something about our preferences and then this fun fact about diminishing returns, it all just can't, it's like an eclipse. It all just sort of clicks into place. And we see that they're all the same thing depending on whether we're looking at it from the human story angle or from the mathematical angle. The diminishing returns versus the, oh my God, I have, a, I have something in my stomach. I have heartburn for a week. I can't sleep at night. It's all the same thing. And one way to understand how risk acceptant or risk averse you're feeling at any given moment is to not think about that, is to think about how much you're thinking about the diminishing risk of the turns of the thing that you're betting over. If it's just cash, I hope that you're pretty risk averse about that. Have your fun now and again, but eventually just take the short thing, please. Okay? And that's that lets you know something. It, and it means that you're not just going to have your eyes caught by the, well, that isn't the jackpot, but like the, 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 right? A risk acceptant person says, well, I have a tiny chance of this. I will buy this lottery ticket because I like risk. But remember, in expectation, you're going to lose 37 cents on the dollar. And it's fun to play this now and again, but do that just because you think it's fun. If you want to maximize your wealth long term, you wouldn't buy this. You take that dollar and you take a bunch of other dollars that you saved and you'd use them to buy stocks. So that's some interestingness about risk, how you feel about it here, what it has to do with diminishing returns and how they're related. All because we had this stupid Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and we wanted to know when it was useful. I'm not embellishing, that's what's happened over the last two weeks. Now, this is all abstract and there's a good chance you haven't gotten a, even a tiny proportion of it the first time, which is why the problem sets are there. But as you do the problem sets, don't just look at the problem set. Every now and again, stop <laughs> and think, because it's about you. So what are we talking about today? Well, I mean, we, we just sort of continued where we were. We, we, 
And I think we probably went from pretty slow last week to super fast this week. And I'm sorry about that, but I'm, I'm quite confident from what I've seen so far from you that you're, you're nimble, you're creative, you're flexible if you just give yourself the chance to be. You're a lot more flexible than you realize. It's just a matter of getting the right point of view. And so we took where we were and we said, well, if we understand lotteries and expected utility from last week, and we understand preferences like in week two, can we marry the two to help understand how people choose between all these stupid lottery tickets in the world? For example, I'm about to scratch this lottery ticket here on Not So Live TV. This is, uh, let's go with the 10 grand. This is how we got ourselves started. So I'm gonna scratch this lottery ticket. Cause this is what we talked about today was my decision to purchase this. And it seems to me that I ought to at least give myself a chance to enjoy. If I'm risk accepting, I ought to give myself the chance to actually enjoy the risk. This is not something fun to just have sitting around. Although if you ask me in class about the great tulip uh, craze, the Dutch tulip craze, I'll be happy to talk to you about that where people really did just have lottery tickets sitting around. And as luck would have it, literally luck, I did not win any money, right? So we knew that my probability for, of not winning money with the scratch ticket was something in the neighborhood of 0.8. I think it was 0.795. So this lottery ticket, Oh, now I don't have autofocus anymore because I've decided it's the devil. This lottery ticket is worth zero dollars now. I didn't know, but now I know. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, Rob made a really stupid decision. And that's probably true. When do you get to be snarky? And I actually think that you get to be a snarky judge far less often than you think that you get to. And with all that in mind, I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. So on the back of this lottery ticket, well, not this lottery ticket. I actually had to go to the website for this one. But on the back of, lo of lottery tickets or on the websites, whenever you buy a lottery ticket, you know what the probabilities are going to be. And those probabilities are related to how many tickets they print and how many of those tickets are given winning combinations rather than losing combinations. They control that. They control that. They know how many winners there are out of the stack of all the lottery tickets that got printed somewhere. Okay? So those probabilities that you're playing with are objective and correct probabilities. If I said to you that this thing has a 0.0925% chance of letting you get your money back, if I said that to you, that is correct in the sense that 9.25% uh, of the lottery tickets give you that, okay? Those are objective, correct probabilities that were created for the purposes of playing a game where we know going in that we're going to lose money in expectation, but it was fun to scratch this ticket. I enjoyed it. I got a little, I, I don't know about you, but when you scratch a lottery ticket, you get, a, it's fun. You get, there's all this excitement. What could happen? What could happen? What could happen? It just sort of goes through your head. I thought that there was, I thought I was going to win 10 grand right now, even though I had no chance because I thought it would be interesting to think about what that would look like if I happened to be filming it. It was fun to me, but I knew objectively that it was pretty unlikely. Unless you knew that I get 37 cents of happiness whenever I scratch one of these things, I would pay 37 cents for the joy of doing that. Not too many times, but I would pay 37 cents to do it. There's diminishing returns on my on the lottery tickets. If I told you that, then, then there wouldn't be anything to second guess. And you would say, okay, well, Rob is the kind of person that enjoys scratching lottery tickets. And who am I to begrudge him scratching a lottery ticket, even if he knows with clear eyes that it's going to cost him 37 cents on the dollar? There isn't one right, right way to pick a pop. There's a right way to choose condition on whatever your preferences happen to be. Similarly with lotteries. And it's true in the sense that if you like risk too much, then your expected outcome of that will be very far from what you would have expected if you had just been risk neutral. The risk neutral person does the best overall in expectation, but they might not have the most fun. There's another thing though. The probabilities are subjective. You know, one way to come up with axiomatic foundations for probabilities is just to begin from bets, the choices that people make with their money. It isn't about probability, it's rather about actions. And when somebody chooses a risky thing, they're essentially saying that I'd be willing to take a bet on that. So if I go make a bet on a horse at certain odds, if, if the horse is a real long shot and I go make a bet on them, what I'm saying is I assign a higher probability to them winning than everybody else appears to. If I buy a stock that is currently cheap, then what I'm saying is fact, in effect is I think it's going to go up by more than everybody else seems to think that it's going to. Now that can be for objective reasons, like maybe I researched the horse or the company, but it could also be for just objective reasons. Some of the most important developments of probability and statistics arose not for like mathy reasons or whiteboard reasons, but philosophical reasons. 
So there's subjectivity at least two ways. There's subjectivity in terms of what the right probabilities to assign are, which might be because you have more information than I do, or that might just be because we just have different numbers. And there's subjectivity in terms of how much you like risk or don't. But the raw inputs are up to you. They're not up to me. So long as these subjective decisions are part of us, so long as there's subjectivity that's tied into our humanity and the rich variety of all that we are, second guessing is a real d move. So part of the fun of all this actually isn't just showing you this particular avenue for introspection, but actually acknowledging that it's a hell of a Mr. Potato Head doll too. So what we're going to do on our problem set isn't just go through the calculations of expected utility, but we're also going to explore some of the places where it doesn't seem to do everything we would like it to do, some of its shortcomings in terms of how it performs in the real world. So I hope that you have a lot of fun with that, not just because it's fun to do really well in your problem sets and not just because there's all sorts of funky colors and weird drawings, but also because it gives you even richer opportunities to pause and reflect. Now, if you don't have the time to do that this week, then that's okay. You know, you might have to come back. You might have to revisit when there's time and that's okay. But along the way, remember, signpost what you need to learn. What you need to do right now is do this problem set. I'm looking forward to helping you with that over the course of the week. But in the meantime, thanks for watching.